let's finish up talking about the mysteries of quantum mechanics uh, with probably the most famous one, Schrodinger's cat. So here's the setup. We've got a cat in a box uh, together with this nefarious contraption. We've got some sort of radioactive substance that um, occasionally emits some sort of particle, maybe an alpha particle or something, detected by a detector, maybe a Geiger counter. That's hooked up to a hammer that'll break a vial of poison and kill the cat if uh, the uh, radioactive substance actually emits a particle. We could imagine that it's really just maybe one atom and um, whether or not it emits a particle is a fundamentally quantum mechanical probabilistic process. So we probably want to imagine that scenario where this, where the actual um, sample of radioactivity is very, a very, very simple quantum system. So it has, let's say, a 50-50 chance of emitting a particle in a given time. And we want to know what happens to the cat. And the, claim, the usual claim is that because of the way you have to describe the quantum mechanical particle, this very simple system of the particle whether it will decay or not, in a g given amount of time, if it hasn't been observed, that's again sort of the usual way of saying this, then it would be accurate to describe it in a superposition state between having emitted the particle and not having emitted the particle. Well, that seems to say that the whole system, including the cat, should be in a macroscopic superposition state. Uh, and in particular, the cat should be in a superposition between dead and alive. And depending on exactly what interpretation you're, you're hearing this in, it's before a, some, whatever a measurement might be uh, or even a conscious observation. Um, so any way you slice it, no matter what interpretation you put on it, it's a deeply counterintuitive and disturbing thought experiment. Um, but I want to talk about a few ways to get away from this idea of that it depends essentially on measurement or conscious observation and also the idea, attack a little bit this idea that it must be a, a superposition, superposition between dead and alive, um, which would have a very unclear meaning. What would that mean for the cat? What would it feel like for the cat is kind of one interesting uh, uh, question. So first I'm going to pr present two things that give you lead you toward a, a partial resolution, maybe, of the mystery here. Uh, first of all, I, I don't know if you can read this on uh, YouTube, but the reason Schrodinger's cat is depressed is that no one came to my birthday party slash funeral. I like this. I got this one off the web, like all my pictures. Um, so I mentioned decoherence <coughs> Excuse me, before. And remember, decoherence is what happens when you take a simple uh, microscopic quantum system and when you make it interact with a macroscopic system. And it's not so much the size that matters, it's the complexity of the system. And decoherence is an effect that's going to happen in um, almost any situation like that, unless you work incredibly hard to prevent it. And it's an actual dynamical effect. It's not something uh, that you have to put in artificially in the interpretation. Um, it really actually is, is happening in terms of the basic structure of quantum mechanics and the predictions. It really captures the different nature of macroscop most macroscopic objects. And what it does is it changes superpositions to ordinary mixtures and brings in ordinary probability. So uh, let me remind you a little bit about what's going on with that. Um, the best thing is the contrast in the two-slit experiment. Remember when you had um, electrons or photons going through the two slits, each slit separately had a very simple distribution of probabilities, but those don't add in the normal way for probabilities, and they can even cancel each other out um, when you have quantum superposition. You have what's called interference effects. That's really very, very strange. Um, the, f the idea that the cat may be dead or may be alive, that it's fundamentally probabilistic, is weird enough but the idea that somehow it could be in some sort of state that has superposition or interference effects um, is very, very weird, that you can't even use the ordinary rules of probability. But remember what happened when you put a detector at one of these slits, what happens there is it turns back more into the bullet situation. That if you put a detector at one of these slits, then they start, if you know which one it goes through, then it behaves like ordinary probability. And that's a decoherence effect, that you are um, taking this superposition and turning it into sort of an ordinary probabilistic mixture. So that's part of what's um, going on to make it a bit less mysterious, that the weirdest weird nature of superpositions and the fact that they don't even behave like ordinary probabilities 
and you can have interference effects. That would be extremely weird uh, with the cat. And decoherence pretty much says that's not going to happen. But there is still this issue of um, what is what is actually happen, happening to the cat. I, is it half dead, half alive? What what is going on with that? So to go further with that, let's look at the what the consistent histories treatment would be. And let me just say a word about why it's called the consistent histories approach to quantum mechanics. History here is not in the big sense of like uh, uh, generals and presidents and things like that. A history is simply take a particular quantum system, any system in principle, and look at a sequence of statements about that, uh, s that system in time. And consistent histories is referring to the fact that there's, you can look at various different sequences of statements about a quantum system and some of them will be consistent with each other and some of them will not. They won't be compatible in the sense of uh, putting them together to make meaningful logical statements. So here's an example of that, um, rather like the EPR example in the previous video. Um, the claim is that there's two incompatible descriptions of the process, and this is straight from Griffiths who was the first inventor of this, this approach. Um, one would be the cat is dead or alive. I want to say statements like the cat is dead or the cat is alive. So those are kinds of statements that I'm obviously interested in. And the question is, are those the kinds of statements that are even compatible with statement two, the cat is in a superposition state or even a mixture state or not, doesn't, let's not worry too much about exactly what kind of mixture it is. Um, but let's just, let's just use the word superposition still. And I put cat in quotes here because um, the observation that Griffiths makes is that statement number two, this really should say this mix, this bunch of a trillion trillion atoms and protons and electrons and quantum fields and whatever is in a certain state. You can actually make the mathematical state, uh, me make the mathematical statement that that bunch of atoms is in a super certain superposition state, but it's not uh, compatible with the statement hey, that bunch of atoms on the left there is a cat, much less the statement, it is a cat and the cat is dead, or the, it, it is a cat and the cat is alive. So it's a rather weird solution to the puzzle to say that, you know, you have to first, before you even ans ask, ask or answer questions about what's happening to the cat, you have to make sure you can have a precise quantum description of what a cat is, which is an incredibly complicated thing to even to do. And um, it's not, that kind of description is fundamentally going to be incompatible with the statement that this whole system is in a superposition state. That's a, the kind of statement, those are the two kinds of statements that are uh, incompatible with each other. You can actually mathematically show that kind of thing. Um, so uh, it's a kind of a weird thing, but the way Griffiths talks about it and the practitioners of consistent history say, if you're trying to resolve a, a paradox about quantum mechanics, then you've got to rigorously describe everything in the system quantum mechanically using the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics. And then you might see that what you're trying to say isn't really meaningful. It's gonna, it might come out to be like saying a certain electron has its x spin being plus and simultaneously its y spin being plus. And that kind of statement is, it's not particularly controversial to say that this isn't really a meaningful statement. Um, a lot of people wouldn't focus on the logical aspect of it, but I don't think they'd be that object, they'd object to it that much to say, oh yeah, okay, that's really, let's just say that's not a meaningful statement. Um, some people would say you can't measure them simultaneously, but I strongly think that the better way to say it is it's just not a logically meaningful combination. If you start to accept that, then you are somewhat naturally led to the idea that complicated statements like these aren't compatible either. So. This somebody is trying to use an extremely formal mathematical version of quantum mechanics to say the whole system is in this weird superposition state. And you can actually formally write that down. And it's very useful for computation. And what Griffiths points out is that sometimes what may have happened is that it's so useful for computation, people started to attach too much meaning to it and started assuming that this mathematical hypothetical superposition state is actually compatible with asking questions about whether the cat is dead or alive. And the claim is that it's not. Okay. So to sum up the consistent histories approach, the, the big slogan is that there can be different and fundamentally incompatible descriptions of the same one reality. It's not a multiple reality thing. It's not many worlds like Everett's many worlds interpretation. Um, but it 
might seem a tiny bit similar, um, but it's really closer to the Copenhagen interpretation than to many worlds probably. The idea is that there are different frameworks which are sort of fragments of logic, uh, sets of questions and sets of different hypothetical histories that may or may not have happened in the system that you can say, did this happen or not? What's the probability of anything particular history happening? Those frameworks can be incompatible with each other, but each framework is useful for answering different questions. Like here, there was one framework was uh, here, is the cat in a superposition state? Well, if you kind of use the framework where that makes sense, the answer is actually yes, uh, with, with probability 100%. But that doesn't address the question of whether the cat is dead or alive because it comes from a different framework. Um, and it turns out that if you look at all the traditional quantum paradoxes or weirdness of quantum mechanics, it all comes down to using different frameworks and pretending they're compatible when they're not. Um, so it does give you a kind of unifying treatment of, of how those paradoxes occur if you believe in this approach. Um, why don't we see this in classical phenomena? Why haven't we seen this before? Why didn't Newton see this? Um, it's because of decoherence, that when you get complicated systems that have multiple interacting parts, uh, then almost inevitably, unless you go to the extreme lengths that people building quantum computers now can go to, um, you're going to get decoherence and that basically is an effect that makes this frameworks uh, more and more compatible and essentially compatible to, to an incredible degree. Um, so like in the EPR effect, I mentioned that if you, uh, EPR effect comes in when you wait to measure electron one and you wait to measure electron two and you get these weird qu statements about what must electron two have been doing or what state must it have been earlier before it got detected. Well, suppose you measure electron two right off the bat, right when it comes out, that is gonna introduce a decoherence effect by interacting with the comp big complicated measuring apparatus. And it's gonna destroy the weirdness and the sort of superposition type effects and the entanglement in particular, okay? So um, that's, that tells us why we've never, we never had to deal with this before quantum mechanics came on the scene. Um, but it's still very disturbing to have this slogan this idea that there's, yes, there's one reality, so one advantage is that it's supposed to be that reality is unique, um, but that you can have different and fundamentally incompatible descriptions. Um, one thing to mention, though, is that the, simply the fact that it's disturbing and weird is not in itself an argument against this approach to interpreting quantum mechanics. If you have, if someone is, proposes to you an interpretation for uh, quantum mechanics that's not deeply weird and counterintuitive, it must be wrong. So not saying that that proves this is the absolute correct approach, but remember that uh, just because it's disturbing and weird is not in itself an objection. Advantages, the claimed advantages, and I couldn't say I've, I would say uh, these are proved, but these are the claimed advantages that I think are pretty plausibly um, claimed by Griffiths and, and his collaborators. Um, that one is reality is unique. It's not a many worlds kind of interpretation. Reality is not dependent on observers or especially the idea of consciousness. That doesn't play a special role, and that appeals to me very much. It gets you away from a lot of the mystical uh, nonsense that comes out uh, of a lot of people talking about quantum mechanics. There's no ill-defined collapse or reduction of the wave packet process that takes you from probabilities to certainty. Um, you don't have to posit some sort of weird process that we don't even know when it happens or how it could happen physically. Or It, 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 it just seems so mysterious to have this kind of thing in a theory. Um, you might think that this is really bad because you have these different incompatible descriptions. You might not even be able to know when can I use this statement? When can I use this other statement? Can I combine them or not? I, are they compatible? Well, there's actually very well-defined conditions on what consistency means. When to a family of histories is consistent. When it, puts to, when it can be put together into a single framework for describing reality. It's very um, particular mathematical conditions on the structure of the quantum mechanical system. So that's really nice. And of course, as I said before, the classical world is recovered. The correspondence principle is recovered from the, the decoherence effect, that the fact that on the micro level for certain systems you might have incompatible frameworks, that goes away when you describe traditional classical phenomena. So I like all these advantages. It is a weird way of thinking, but um, it's, I think it deserves uh, more um, to be better known than it is, and so that's why I made this video.